So Simon was talking about, towards the end, um, about gaming and about gaming your company or gaming the situation. So the way I see lean startup principles in any company, big, small, uh, barely getting started, really, you know, 100-year-old companies is basically you're trying to take, get ed every advantage you can to uh, game kind of your business and uh, kind of accelerate it. So I'm going to talk through kind of the lean startup principles and go into some examples from my own world and my own life, and then I will um, all along the way talk about how this can be applied to bigger and larger organizations, although it's not really much different. It's more of a shift in thinking and uh, uh, mentality. So I've been doing business on the web for about eight years now. Uh, my first company was called ACS. It was a consulting company. Uh, we did a lot of things around internet marketing. So we helped people drive traffic to their websites, which uh, naturally got us into using a lot of the different analytics tools. Um, but before we really got into that in my next company, we, we tried to build a lot of different products. So uh, we probably tried to build about over 20 different web-based products. Uh, the reason is because we were running a consulting company and we didn't want to do that forever because uh, it sucks. And uh, it doesn't scale in your multiples when you sell it really suck. Uh, so anyways, uh, the one that ended up working was called Crazy Egg. Uh, what Crazy Egg does is it creates a heat map for where people are clicking on your web pages. So it's a visual representation of data, basically. And that also got me into big data uh, in some ways. Uh, and that business is still running. It's about six or seven years old. And uh, it's uh, what I like to call a small business. And about 100 hours a week are spent on it. Um, it's, it's run somewhat lean, but not as lean as um, KISS metrics and some of the other kind of things I've uh, advised and started. Um, what we were doing when we were doing Crazy Egg was we decided to build a second product and that ended up being KISS metrics. And uh, this was about three years ago when we spun it out, raised some money for it. So uh, in my life, I, I, know, I know about running a consulting company, I know about uh, bootstrapping a company, and also um, learning a lot about uh, running a venture-backed company. And uh, the big, big thing for me was failure that attracted me to all these principles and um, some of the folks that I'm gonna mention uh, in a couple seconds. And uh, the big thing about that failure was that we failed a lot in our consulting company, trying to build products, trying to build businesses beyond just consulting. Uh, one of our largest failures was we wasted about a million dollars trying to build a hosting company, a web hosting company. Um, and we actually never put the site up or never launched it, and we spent that much money trying to build it. So uh, I never want to do that again, and I really am uh, passionate about making sure no one else ever has to deal with the kind of things that come with losing a million dollars of your own money. Um, so one of the key things here is that lean startups are built to learn. What we're trying to do is we're trying to learn how our customers are going to respond and what they want to pay for all the time. And that's really the, the core of the principles, uh, which is around you're not, you're not just you know, kind of building and building and building and building. What you're really trying to do is learn as you build um, or hopefully keep kind of learning uh, and building less, believe it or not. So these three guys uh, are what I'd call the lean startup heroes. And uh, this is uh, Sean Ellis, Dave McClure, and Eric Reese. There's a lot of other people that are talking about lean startups now. This is not at all an exhaustive list of people. But these are the folks that um, early on during, um, you know, when Eric Reese started blogging and talking about all this stuff, uh, these are the folks that I, were, I was able to find and associate with the concept and the principles. And I've learned a lot from a lot of them, so uh, from all of them. Uh, first off um, is uh, Sean Ellis and his startup pyramid. So basically, with, with the things I'm about to show you from these three people, there's about three things. Um, this is the stuff I always look back at when I think we've you know, lost, lost our course or are, are, are dealing with a difficult decision of what to do next with our product or our business. And the, this, the Sean's is one I always look at and say, are we, are we um, you know, it gives me a framework for thinking about where I am with this business or product. And a lot of your cases, it's probably going to be a product, not necessarily the whole business, because I'm sure you're trying to... Uh, innovate and things like that. And the key here is that you start with um, something that doesn't have product market fit, meaning there's nobody there that really wants it, and you're trying to assess whether that thing has product market fit. Once you determine that it does, you'd basically be optimizing everything so that you can start growing. And you know, I'll, I'll get into some of these concepts later, but the big thing is like just giving you some framework of knowing at what stage you're at in terms of this product and whether you, you're ready to start pouring a lot of money into it to grow it. 
Um, and the more disciplined you can be about this, the more likely you are to have a really um, successful and high growth business. Uh, next up is Dave McClure's R, and today is National Pirates Day, is what I hear. Um, so, yeah, I'm sure he'll love that uh, everyone's following along. Uh, this is an interesting one. So, this is something that we actually cleaned up. So, we designed this for him after he has this really messy version of it that's really colorful. We try to keep the colors in there, but not make it as messy. Uh, this, is, this is a very tactical kind of chart to help you understand what are the different tactics for different parts of a product. And it starts with acquisition, uh, then it goes to activation, then it moves on to retention, referral, and revenue. And the idea here is that there's just a whole bunch of tactics on what you can do to kind of move the needle on any of these different pieces inside of the business. Um, and this is something I would use in conjunction with uh, Eric Reese's um, basically lean startup principles, which have everything to do with the concept of build, measure, and learn. And the whole idea here is that if you can structure your company in such a way, we're able to move through this loop faster and faster. You're, you're basically um, um, more likely, you're basically learning really fast, and you're also building things that people want at the same time. So I'm going to go through some details around this and some of the things that we've applied in the past. Um, so one way that you build faster is by, in short, being able to let anyone on your team even non-engineers. I'm not an engineer. I have a local copy of Kissmetrics. We have a lot of customers, and I'm able to deploy code. I'm not an engineer, though. Um, but I cannot mess it up. And the reason for that is it's all based around test-driven development. All the tests happen after I deploy the code. They're all automated, and there's full test coverage on the whole um, product. And it's an analytics product, lots of stuff going on, but we have full test coverage. And the reason we, we, we want to do this is because if, if we learn something in the morning, about our customers, something even relatively major, and we want to change it, we're able to make a change. Depending on how long that change takes to code up or whatever, we're able to make that change and test it um, in a matter of minutes to hours, um, usually not much more than that, depending on how large the change is. And so uh, the way I see it is if you're building a product, it's on the web, um, there's no other way to do it. And you know, one of the quotes from InView is that they're probably closer to 100 now is my guess, but on average, they deploy new code 50 times a day. And that's literally straight to production. Um, all the testing happens uh, in the process. Um, we at our company have purposely deployed poorly designed features, short-sighted code, half-known, half-done features, probably less than that a lot of the time, known bugs, and crappy code with major performance issues. That's our CTO in the background working on two computers at once. Um, he is very proud of this. And the reason for that is this has helped us learn faster and build something people actually want and build a bigger business faster. And uh, he's not at all embarrassed by this. This is actually part of uh, what you need to get and comfort uh, sorry, comfortable with um, when trying to apply these principles. And the reason for that is that you know, the, f the faster you can deploy stuff, the faster you can learn. So uh, once you deploy stuff, there's a lot of different ways to measure. And the whole idea is that if you're not able to measure the impact of something you put out there, um, you're not really able to learn from it. And there's a lot of different ways to do it, all the way from qualitative to quantitative methods. I'll talk about one of our qualitative tools later and walk you guys through the journey of our kind of lean startup inside of our company. Um, and that'll kind of explain some of this stuff as well. But the big thing is about understanding whether your customer behavior has changed when you put something out there and knowing also what change you're looking for at the same time. Um, and the key about those changes is that a lot of times we can get stuck with the minutia of like, are more people clicking on this red button versus the screen button and things like that. Instead, what it's really about is how does this have a, how does, how does whatever we do have a effect on our macro metrics? So our macro metrics are like, you know, really big things like are people buying more or are more people activating the product? Activation, um, as she, seen earlier in Dave McClure's termolo terminology, means um, that, pe uh, you know, are people having that first delightful experience and are more, more of them having it? So this is another kind of key thing, which is anything you do, you want to measure against what your macro kind of conversion points are. And typically in most businesses, for each type of user, sometimes when you have a marketplace, you have two users, uh, maybe even three, um, you have about three to seven different macro metrics. It's, I've never found a scenario where it's more than that. Um, so if you're able to measure this stuff and set, set yourself up to measure it, then anything you do, you can measure against these really important and key metrics to the product. So um, the, this is one of the more challenging ones, which, which is the learn part. 
which is basically also has a lot to do with like what do you do next after you deploy something, you've measured it, you're looking at the data. And this has everything to do with um, talking to customers, um, figuring out how to test things much faster so you're going straight to the learnings. Uh, we'll, we will put fake tabs with surveys. Um, fake meaning you click them, you don't get the feature, but you get a survey. Uh, we measure the clicks on the different tabs. We test the copy on them. Um, there's a lot of tactical things you can do. Other things we do is we'll, we'll talk to customers and uh, go through a process of customer development, which is uh, something uh, Steve Blank came up with. Uh, he's a professor at Stanford and Berkeley and talks about the process of actually iteratively learning from customers, just like you would do product development. You're doing customer development at the same time. And uh, I'll go through an example of that as well. Um, um, before I do that, uh, let's, uh, I'm going to talk about minimum viable products and pivots, just because I'm sure a lot of you have heard of that, but haven't really grokked it or understood fully what it means. So a minimum viable product is basically um, designed to answer a specific question for you, uh, a question related to some hypothesis that you have. Again, I'll go through an example, but um, here are a bunch of examples that you're probably familiar with. So the first one, we would, you could say that Apple's um, first version of their iPhone, the 2G, I guess, um, was a minimum viable product. There were a lot of things about it that when you look at that one versus even the iPhone 4 and the upcoming iPhone 5, it's a whole world of a difference. And if they can do it with hardware, then we can definitely do it with software. Another thing was uh, the first version of Gmail was literally written in a day. And that's a quote from the engineer that built it. Uh, he's now a uh, Y Combinator, and then he's an investor. But uh, I think my, my belief is, um, this in the background that you can barely see, is uh, basically that original version. I think that the hypothesis around it had something to do with threading or sorting of email. And that's why he was able to build it uh, within a day and see if people actually cared to use it. And I believe this was really started as an internal project and not, not exactly thought of on that day as something that would turn into what we know and a lot of us love today. And this is an example from a startup that actually uh, pivoted or failed, I don't remember. And what they were doing is you could sign up for their free plan, but then in that whole sign up process, you were also able to uh, check and get notified about the pro product. And the whole idea here is that they're able to kind of do a smoke test or fake it till they made it, literally, um, and be able to see if people even wanted to buy their pro plan and what percentage of people opted to getting notified about it. So this serves multiple purposes. One is, are people e do people even care enough that they're checking that box? Um, the other purpose would be um, be able to notify them when you actually have it, or if they've opted in, you can probably talk to them and find out what more they might be looking for and things like that. So next is the pivot. Um, and uh, this concept is all about um, the idea that a lot of different companies, most companies, end up changing directions um, as they go through um, kind of the life cycle of their product and their business. And one, one of the things I want to point out here is that um, a lot of companies, like whether you know it or not, have been through this process. Uh, most companies, in fact, have. And a lot of these principles that I'm talking about, these are all things that entrepreneurs have been doing for years, managers, whoever, they've all been doing for years. But now we have actually a way of thinking about them with a bunch of frameworks and principles and lots of examples as well. And people like me just talking at you. Um, so uh, YouTube actually did a pivot. And it was a customer need pivot. So if you look at that, basically, um, uh, it, it, it represents a search for a dating site. It says, I'm male seeking everyone between 18 and 45. Does anybody use YouTube for dating? No, not anymore. Uh, but they used to, and this is what it was all about. And then they basically, what they did is they discovered the customer need around the videos, and they pivoted into that. Um, another great example is PayPal. So um, what they started out, you know, this is, a lot of you probably know this, but they actually started out with uh, the thing at the top that I've read, it, uh, I've, I've squared away and read. Um, it says, PayPal lets you beam money to anyone with a Palm organizer. That's not what they do today, we all know that. That's not what they got bought for by eBay. And this is basically a feature pivot. The, the, the line below it says, PayPal lets you send money to anyone with an email address. That's what they do today. And that's what they've done for a long time. So they basically pivoted on a single feature um, that they discovered uh, was uh, really popular. 
And so what, what ends up happening with a pivot is that you, you learn something and then you end up figuring out what type of, you know, what type of changes you need to make to better serve a different market, uh, same market with a different feature, and there's a whole number of different configurations for this. But it, we're basically just bringing terminology to things that people were doing uh, historically. And then this one's my favorite one. I'd say Mark, Mark Zuckerberg's always pivoting, always thinking about what's that next thing he can do to make the business bigger, more interesting, and, and hit his own personal vision for what the product's there to do. Um, what he did a while ago was a platform pivot, which has inevitably led to this whole like button in your face everywhere. Um, and I'm sure there's some vision behind it, and we'll, we're, we're, we're not at the... We're not at the last pivot of, for that company, and we might even hear about another one in the next couple of days. They're holding a conference. Um, so, as I said before, it's all about starting with a question or a hypothesis, um, and uh, this is a uh, this is a hypothesis for one of our products, um, and uh, this is a format that we like to use for it. So, basically, uh, it's uh, the format would be our hypothesis is that this type of person or people have a problem doing X. And in our case, we had a hypothesis around uh, one of our n new products we were building, and it was that our hypothesis is that product manager type people have a problem doing effective customer research. So this product ended up, this is what it uh, looks like today. Um, basically, the story behind this was that we were working on KISS metrics, and we were hitting a bunch of big data challenges that were going to take us a couple months to resolve. We already had customers at the time, but we realized that to add the features that we needed, we actually had to hunker down and uh, build a bunch of infrastructure out. So what we basically had at the time was about an eight or nine person team. Uh, what we did was we, we, we let you know, the three or four people that needed to work on the main product and these big challenges uh, keep working on it. And we decided to discover a, a new opportunity that's uh, very related to what our business is all about. And uh, this was the product that ended up coming out of it. And I'm going to walk you through kind of the earliest steps that we went through in the product that actually took, I, I believe last I checked, they took about less than 10 days. Um, and so that's the hypothesis again, which is that product manager type people have a problem doing effective uh, customer research. And we had these different uh, words in there, fast, effective, frequent, uh, specifically because that's, that's kind of the pain we felt um, when we were trying to develop products. And that's also kind of what our hypothesis came out of. Um, and so what we wanted to learn is, what are people doing now? What are the other tools leaving on the table? So one of the reasons we chose that question specifically was that we weren't really happy with the way a lot of the other tools were helping you get customer feedback. Uh, we also wanted to know who's involved in, 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 in kind of getting that customer feedback, who's uh, reacting to it, um, who's um, required to get that feedback. And also, how frequent severe is a pain? And is there anything else that customers are complaining about? This is a key one because you might already, based on these learnings, these interviews, and this process I'm going to show you, um, figure out that you need to change direction. So really trying to, while you have that person asking them uh, what else are customers complaining about is super important. The other thing I'll point out is that we didn't tell them what we were thinking of building. That's a really important point when it comes to this customer development process. Um, don't bias. Uh, the person you're interviewing with any idea of what you're trying to build beyond just a high level of it. Um, and the reason for that is that if, so, if you ask someone, hey, would you buy this, they're going to say yes, or would you use this? When you, and then when you actually put it out there, um, they usually don't. So what we did is, um, this, these are different ways we learned. One of, the, one of the key ones was we did 20 phone interviews. They were very short interviews. We asked some of those questions that I mentioned, most of those. Um, we did some user tests after we did those interviews just to see if um, we were generally headed in the right direction uh, with our solution. And then we, added, we created two landing pages, collected a bunch of email addresses. We actually built a hacky MVP. And we had eight alpha testers on a, on a little hackier MVP for other people. And this was all um, the first uh, four steps were done within 10 days. And the last one, uh, we took another 10 days to build that out a little bit and test it out uh, with those alpha testers to make sure that we were headed in the right direction. And what we learned um, through this process um, and focusing on those questions that were very open-ended and trying to find the patterns with our interviews is that people are not doing customer research. They want private feedback, so they didn't want it like, uh, in, like you know, when a customer posts feedback, they didn't want it to go out there publicly in an ideas forum or anything like that. Um, and they wanted some sort of targeting on who to ask the question to and when. 
And it also required developer involvement every time they wanted to get feedback, at least with the people we were talking to, and that it's a constant pain. If they could solve this problem and get that feedback um, all the time, they'd be very happy and look like the lady in the chair there in the background. Um, so what we, wanted, what we ended up building is Kiss Insights. It's one of our products as part of Kiss Metrics. And uh, it's uh, you know, uh, on-site customer feedback tool. You, you get a little survey pop-up on the bottom right of your pages, and you can ask a question to anybody, new visitors, return visitors, based on certain search terms, on certain pages, whatever you want to do. And all, all that with just one JavaScript. Uh, and um, you get private customer feedback. So you get you know, reporting where you can see what people responded and all that kind of stuff. And on the paid plans, you can create your own questions and things like that as well and get a bunch of other options. So I'm going to pause here for a quick second. But the big, the big thing here is that this was an initiative inside of our existing company to build a new product. And we needed to do it super fast because we had a very finite amount of time that we had to build the product. Um, this product's already in the market. Um, it has product market fit, and we'll be starting to scale it very soon. Um, it's close to product market fit. There's a few tweaks we still need to do. And so this process I just went through, you can do super fast. You can do with very few people. Um, one of the key things that, that you know I, I know many of you are probably aware of uh, and deal with day to day is that you can get into a lot of... Uh, debates and things like that internally inside of large companies as well as small companies. And so what we like to do these days is that when, when debates start happening, we just try to figure out how to learn whether you know, there is a right answer to this and try to come up with some hypothesis, even if it has to do with debating different home pages or different copy. Um, a lot of things are not testable, but these days we've found that most things are either testable or you can validate them through customer research and things like that um, or customer development. And so. Um, yeah, so I, I chose this example primarily because I think any, any company can go through this process and come up with some innovation around uh, you know, an idea that they have. And before we did this, we actually uh, hadn't seen anyone using uh, creating products like this where you can ask a question on any page. Um, and it's a little pop-up and it has targeting. So this was, I guess, innovative for better or worse. Um, so I'm going to go through a little bit of our process here. And uh, this is basically uh, has more to do with the business side. Um, well, not just the business side, but operationally. What do we do? What are things? How are how are what's a, how is our process different? Um, now that we're lean, uh, so this one's a pretty key concept. Uh, I haven't kind of uh, seen it talked about enough. And uh, this works really well when you're a really small team or even early in an early stage company. But the whole idea is you actually don't have departments. You don't have sales. You don't have marketing. You don't have engineering. You don't have design. You basically have a problem team and you have a solution team. And so in, in our example, what we did was uh, with the interview questions, all that, that was all the problem team. The problem team was trying to come up with what are the most important problems to solve for customers. And what we did is we basically came up with a hypothesis and then, and then went and asked all those questions and discovered all the problems people had with the kind of the area that we were focused on. And from there, what we did is um, the prototyping, the hacky MVP on our own site, and also the um, hackier MVP that we put out to customers, all that stuff were things that the solution team worked on. And their whole goal in, the, in, in stages was to find the minimal solution for any given problem. And there's cross-functional folks on the team and stuff like that. But the way it really works is the faster you can go through that loop I showed er earlier that was Eric's and also implement this sort of uh, team, the, the, the team dynamic of having two separate teams uh, working on these things, um, the faster you're going to discover what the problems are in your space and also how to solve them really well. So um, the, 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 the problem team is usually focused on having non-business people, sometimes de I mean, I'm sorry, business people, sometimes designers, and, you, and what I like to call a generalist, somebody that you feel very comfortable being able to talk through problem and solution. Um, and, and understanding constraints of technology and stuff like that. And then the solution team is primarily usually designers and uh, engineers. And so they're the doers, so to speak. And the whole idea is that they're basically given problems with no real direction on the solutions. And then there can be a discussion around what's a minimal way we can take 
build something and then go toss it back to the problem team to understand what the problems are with that thing we built. So the, this is the constant kind of back and forth between these two teams. And early on, especially in a company, this is super important. Um, but even when you have teams inside of bigger organizations, I'd say that this is something definitely worth uh, experimenting with and seeing if um, you can provide any kind of uh, sp uh, increase the speed and velocity of discovering what problems are that people have. The other thing we did is we started doing uh, very short 15 to 45 minute team meetings, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And the focus of that was on Monday, you'd basically have, um, this is when we were really like in optimization and kind of uh, trying to you know, increase conversion rates and things like that. What we would do is we'd have a Monday meeting where you'd have the problem team talk about what the problems are to solve this week. Um, and then we'd either have till a certain time on Tuesday to come up with what the solutions are, or sometimes the solutions are very obvious to some of those problems. So then the engineers would start uh, writing code pretty fast. And a lot of the times, like fast meaning, there's already code deployed by, by, the, by Monday evening, and we're already starting to see data on Tuesday. And then Wednesday, we'd have a meeting to see how we're doing that week on solving those problems and if there is anything we can do with the data and if we can already start kind of going through another cycle. Uh, typically, what happens is we do a review on Friday and be able to figure out a hint of kind of what the problems are going to be next week. Because by this time, in a five-day period, we've already figured out, we've already built, went through the build, measure, learn loop, sometimes even three or four times, not just one time. Um, and also, um, you know, this, this, this was incorporated with the problem team, solution team dynamic. That way, um, people knew what's, what team they were on and also what their kind of responsibilities were and what they needed to be doing next. So this was just a way of organizing that we found to be very effective. And the other thing is that um, we actually ended up building an a internal project management tool because what we noticed is that um, there were always a lot of problems to solve, but um, the solution team was always inundated with new stuff uh, until we got the meetings and then we, had, we divided the company up uh, into those two teams. So basically, the way the system works is that there's five tasks that anybody can have at any given time, and there's only one that can be green-lighted. And uh, if, I tr if I were to try to add a task to, for anybody, um, if they already have five, I can't. I have to actually make the decision of removing one. And so this, this, this allowed us to have a lot more um, visibility into what everyone was working on and help everyone stay focused on the task at hand. And if something need to be, uh, needed to be adjusted, it was um, relatively easy to make that adjustment and let everyone or whoever's making that adjustment know what the opportunity cost is in terms of the other, uh, other items on the list. Um, and that really helped us focus and hone in on how to kind of learn faster and get through that loop faster. Um, and here are a few lessons that we've learned along the way um, using this kind of process. So one thing is that um, if you notice, there's like three different parts for the build, measure, learn kind of uh, diagram and getting through all that. And there's a lot of different things in it. Uh, what we ended up doing is, and, and we're, we're right now dealing with another stage of this problem, is that when we sped up one part of the company, if the other pieces weren't keeping up, we'd actually lead to all kinds of issues. Um, issues of like somebody not knowing what to do or working ahead of another piece of the business and then we had all this code sitting around that no one was actually learning from and we weren't measuring right um, and things like that. So what we really had to do was fine tune around, what, one, one thing that helped was dividing the, the teams um, into those two teams and another thing that helped was the structure around the meetings. But until we really had that, um, we, we were crashing into each other basically, so to speak. Um, because um, you know one part one part of the business was ahead of another, et cetera, and even in our business right now um, we we because of these processes and because the engineering part of lean startup principles are very like uh, uh, they 're binary either you 're doing them or you 're not, um, and I recommend you do them. Um, engineering becomes really fast. So in our company, engineering is actually well ahead of the rest of the company. And so what we're doing is we're trying to implement more processes. We, we've grown to about 16 people now, and we're implementing processes around sales and marketing and other parts of the business because uh, um, the problem team, solution team stuff uh, has kind of, um, as we grew, we, we had to kind of uh, limit our, uh, we had to limit our way of doing things like that because um, we had a lot of other responsibilities that came up, whether it's sales or marketing. And so now we're, we're, we're trying to implement all these principles around, or along other parts of the company so that we can give engineers enough stuff to do, um, which sounds really weird, and I don't like saying that. Uh, 
So uh, the other thing is um, that we discovered is that um, the only path to perfection is iteration. So what we would do is we'd always try to knock out the perfect feature. And uh, this was prior to uh, applying all these principles and you know deploying really bad code and stuff like that. Um, but one of the reasons, one of the main reasons we deploy really you know buggy code, bad code, as fast as we can, knowing that if 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 that if that feature doesn't work and it's one of those many that um, we actually don't continue and we end up having to throw away, we didn't waste any time trying to make something perfect that didn't really matter. And so what, it's, what it was really about that we've discovered is that like just keep iterating and keep iterating based on something that you know you want to learn and something you're building towards, um, and you'll you'll hit that perfect perfection. And and you know. It's kind of funny. You never make anything perfect, so it doesn't even matter. But we, we always try to when we were when we were uh, trying to throw out products, uh, you know, without this process, and that really sucked because we ended up wasting a lot of time and effort and energy focusing on the wrong things. And kind of the last point uh, with our kind of whole focus and some of the systems that we developed to apply these principles was um, basically the whole team became more accountable. So this is a, a comment from one of our engineers who historically, even prior to this process, would sit down and we wouldn't see him for like two weeks. And then all of a sudden he'd pop his head up either frustrated or successful with some project or some bun a bunch of code that he, was, uh, that he wrote, you know, that was great uh, or, again, really bad. Uh, but he'd basically not see the light of day. And what we noticed is once we started implementing all this stuff and there were things happening around him, he he started his time to actually putting his head up and saying, oh, what's going on, ended up becoming shorter. So we were able to actually utilize them a lot better. And uh, in my experience, a lot, lot, lot of engineers typically are, you know, the heads down, kind of focus on what they're doing sort of type of people, and he's definitely one of them. Um, that might as well be him as a kid. Um, and he... Uh, he uh, has completely changed now, and he's actually more in tune with the rest of the team and uh, completely focused on actually getting stuff done versus um, going into his own um, you know, hole and kind of not coming out of it for a while. And the reason for that is the company is moving forward, so what happens is even in those seven days, he's like, all this stuff happened, and I don't know what happened, and I, don't, I haven't kept up, and I've been working on this big piece of code, and it's like, yeah, you didn't have to do that. We could have done it better. So um, this, this was very exciting for me because this was an engineer who I really care about, but it's kind of the, on the edge of productivity for us, um, and then we were able to get him over to the right side, and uh, yeah, he's an awesome contributor now to the team, and I attributed to actually applying this process and helping him kind of uh, grow into kind of the way we have learned to do things. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Uh, apparently, I'm supposed to stand further this way so that I'm, we're both in a frame while Let's I ask you pithy questions. Sure. Um, I read t yesterday somewhere that Charles Darwin was a better economist than Adam Smith. Um, your thoughts on that? You talked a lot about evolution and iteration being yeah. a better uh, eventual uh, producer of results. Yeah. I mean, it seems like that kind of evolution is something that can't happen by committee, right? So. I, I, think, I think the committee it happens by is your customers if you're listening to them. So that's okay. what I would say. I'd say that like, one of the hardest things to do when, you're, when you have a vision for a product, whether in a big company or even as a startup, is actually letting go of that enough so that you can actually hear what people are saying about your, your little baby. And you know, if it's ugly, it's ugly. So that, that's where the evolution happens, which is you can actually make an ugly baby, baby a beautiful baby if you listen to those customers. So uh, that sounds like something that will terrify most traditional business people who are paid for strong opinions and, oh, when I was a sales guy, this is the way we did it kind of thing. Um, what's it going to take to get the boardroom to change the way they think about business? More failure. So more, more failure doing it the, the way we have been doing it, I would say. Um, so le less innovation from large companies, more failure, and a lot of us kind of startups, um, you know, trumping what big companies are able to do super fast. And you cl there's a lot of classic examples. So uh, this may be an apocryphal story, so I apologize if it's inaccurate. The internet will probably tell me so loudly cool. in about 30 seconds. Uh, but I heard that early on, PayPal wasn't actually allowed to do business in several of the states as far as transferring money between states. You have to get legislation passed or certifications. And so when PayPal wanted to get into the uh, money transfer business, they actually weren't legally allowed to start doing their business as they did, uh, but they did it anyway. Um, whereas Visa and MasterCard could enter it because they had 
such big approvals to go through and the cost for PayPal of being sued into oblivion was 10 million bucks. The cost for Visa and MasterCard was unthinkable. So they, because big existing companies have so much more to lose, it's much harder for them to take these kinds of risks versus a startup. Does that constrain whether big companies can apply these methods? I mean, how does it affect what they're going to do? I would say absolutely not. Um, those big companies have their own kind of, you know, limits, and I'd say that they can do other things. So, for example, um, Visa and Ma MasterCard should have built Square much earlier, maybe when PayPal was coming up, right, and seeing that there is something they could do with that market um, for the types of people that PayPal was working for, for example. Right, so I would say that you're always dealing with constraints, whether it's in a startup where you have limited resources and you, know, you could die any day um, and not have any more money, or uh, in a large corporation where you have all these kind of liabilities that you have to account for. So I'd say that you know, those things, I, I look at them as unrelated. Excellent, all right, thank you very much. Yeah, my pleasure, thank you.